Um, let, let's get our Bibles out and turn to 1 Corinthians 15. And uh, I hope you had a great weekend. Did you enjoy yesterday? Uh, a lot of snow. I'm sure that you got to stay inside and watch TV, football, drink hot cocoa. But for 32 of us, we stayed outside. And, um, you know, yesterday was an incredible day because it was uh, our, our day of tagging and our last day of tagging before missions contribution and our last day of tagging for the year. And uh, so, you know, we looked at the weather and the weather said that it was supposed to be light snow from 9 to 12 earlier in the week. So we warned everybody, guys, we, we want to prepare for the worst. Prepare for the snowstorm. It's going to be from 9 to 12. So we get there, and it's pretty light in the morning time. And, uh, and I just got to give it up for our brother Casey, who worked out getting Chick-fil-A sandwiches from the, the sisters that work at Chick-fil-A, like Amber. Um, and then uh, we also, sorry, there's another sister that works there too. Tyler, thank you. And then uh, there's also, uh, we had... Uh, coffee, we had water, we had orange juice, we had Dunkin' Donuts who uh, contributed things, we had bagels and cream cheese, and it was an incredible feast before we started our tagging day, and we thought, man, if this is as bad as the snow is going to get, this is going to be a great day for tagging. This is awesome. So we were excited. Everybody got there. Uh, we had 32 people, like I said, that were out there. And, uh, and as we got ready, we went out and we started tagging at the corner. Tagging simply means that we go to a street corner and we ask people to support our cause, which is supporting, uh, as a nonprofit, we support an international organization of nonprofits that help the communities wherever they're at. So that's all the way in Stockholm and and Moscow and Sao Paulo, Brazil, Mexico City, Santiago, Chile, uh, Chennai, India, Manila, Philippines, and the list goes on and on and on and on. And we're continually using this money so that we can be able to send more people out and plant more churches. So for instance, Lagos, Nigeria is on the map right here. Abidjan is on the map. And uh, the leadership for the continent of Africa is on the map by what we're giving today as a church. Amen? Amen. We're helping the central leadership and we're helping people who have laid foundations for churches in Manila, who have come from uh, Nike and given up their jobs so that they could be able to support the benevolent of the arm of the church, which is Mercy Worldwide. That's Nick and Denise Bordieri, who gave up, Nick gave up a 20 year job at Nike. So that, he, so that he could be able to help the church. And uh, even after, as he gave it up, he still didn't have a guarantee he would go in. So it's men and women like that that we're also supporting to be able to, to fund this. Uh, like I said, Stockholm, Sweden, Toronto, Moscow, Manila, all these different churches were going to help out with what we're doing for this whole donation thing. And then as well, very dear to our hearts, yeah. is of course the Queens New York City mission team that's getting sent out. From Chicago, we're sending out over 20 people to be able to strengthen Syracuse and strengthen New York City and start a church in Queens, New York, one of the most diverse cities in the United States. And no, no better person should go than Jay Shelbrack with his wife, Barb. I don't know why God chose them, uh, but I guess being from Madison, Wisconsin and from the Midwest, you can probably relate to a lot of Queens people. Somehow, some way. I don't know how it's going to happen, but God knows. Amen. It's going to be incredible. And uh, we're confident um, simply as a church that uh, Jay and Barb have done such a tremendous job here leading the church uh, that they're going to go now and be able to take a group of people to, to build one of the most crucial cities to the whole world. And uh, Chicago has the honor to be able to send them out and see that happen. Amen. 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 So as we're out there, we're, we're, we're talking to people and it's going great. The snow gets a little worse. And I think, wow, this is insane. And so I'm taking pictures and the snow's coming down and, you know, it's, it's a light snow. It hadn't gotten to its peak yet. We didn't even know that was coming. And uh, so it, we're taking pictures and I got Barb McMurray right there with Cordero and Josh. And they're fired up to be tagging in this snow. Then I go drop some people off. The snow gets worse. 
I, where it's lunchtime, it gets worse. And now you can't even see around you at all. And one time with my car, I hit the brakes and the car doesn't stop. And I thought, what's wrong with my brakes here? And the car keeps going. And uh, yeah, it's a Prius. It's not that good of a car, you know? It's not made for Chicago weather. I got to get iron spikes to go on it or something, you know? And, uh, and so it just keeps going. And, and then, then I have to pull off to the side to avoid rear-ending the car in front of me. And I luckily, there is no cars in the side uh, parking lane. And I go for about 40 feet past all these cars, just sliding, praying that I don't get in accidents. And, uh, and I started to think, man, this is getting bad right here. And it got bad. I think it probably snowed about eight inches yesterday. Something crazy. And, uh, and so what we were doing, though, is nobody stopped tagging. And the pictures that I was able to take and post, post on Facebook literally were, were like these epic blizzard pictures of fundraising. I've never seen anything like it. It was, I mean, we had some of the brothers that, that wore sweaters after being warned repeatedly that it was going to snow, thank you, wear the sweaters, and I'm thinking, what are you doing? And then by the end of it, their black sweater looked like a cotton ball. <laughs> and uh, it, was, it was intense. It was radical. I mean, it felt like we decided to go tagging on Mount Everest. And uh, I just want to, you know, when you look at like the credits for heroes that have done awesome things, you look at all the names, I just want to read through all the names as the credits of awesome tagging from yesterday. So uh, you have to yell very quickly as I read these names because I'm going to go through them pretty quick. But uh, of course we had Jose that was there, Mike Brooks, Anna Maria, Yuri, Eileen, Lizette, Victor, Marshawn, Cameron, KC, Sandra, LaCara. <laughs> you guys are doing great. All right. King was there. Amen. Um, let's see. I lost my place. Ryan Mason, Victor and Ginger. I was there. Uh, Barb McMurray. V Velmont was there. Mike Thomas, Sam, Josh, Jeanette, Janelle, Stefania, Courtney, Sabrina, Cordero. Still going, Michonne, Frank, Jared, Amelia, Brenda, Billy, Brandon, Monica, Fani, and Valden. Let's give it up for them all. And there, there's, I've never been a part of anything like that. Just to say, I've never been a part of something like that. It, I literally felt like it was, you know, the, the stories you tell your grandkids when you're there. Uh, it was radical. It was as if God wanted us to be in a blizzard so we'd have a great story to tell uh, because it literally came perfectly while we were tagging and it stopped right when we ended. <laughs> Even the cops were telling us to stop because it was, like, it was so bad. So we did like take a break once they told us to stop and then waited for better visibility. But um, I figured, you know, since there's been so much labor for missions contribution, let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Come on. Come on, bro. It says in verse 58, Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. That was a challenge yesterday. Right? It was so icy out. People were slipping around everywhere. Let nothing move you. Amen, Taggers? Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord. Because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. You know, I think it's important to know that our labor, when it's for God, the Bible says it's not in vain. And it's written in the Bible because that can be something that's hard for us to believe occasionally. Yeah. Maybe oftentimes. And, uh, you know, I don't know if you've ever done something, work, that ended up being in vain. Has that ever happened to you? Yeah. Maybe for you students, have you ever written a paper and then it just somehow you accidentally deleted it? Yeah. 
I'm sure that's happened to a lot of us. And all you can think of is, wow, three hours, two hours, however much time, that was just labor and vain right there. And it stings, doesn't it? I mean, there's nothing you can do. It's over. It was, it was in vain. You know, uh, for me, I just want to share about a story of labor in vain. And it was when I first moved to California from Florida. And uh, I had been asked to kind of plan a supplemental mission team in California. And so I went along with our church leader who left the Florida church to go lead in the East region of Los Angeles. And um, so losing your leader to go plant something, this happens all the time. Yep. And, uh, and so when I get out there, I'm there. I've never really worked for an outside company except when I was a paper boy as a kid. I forgot that I used to deliver papers just like Jay did. And uh, it was in Boston. And uh, that was an, an awesome time. Uh, but I also worked for my dad, pressure cleaning roofs. And that was pretty hard too in Florida especially with all the wasps that used to fly at me, you know, and I had to shoot them with my big water gun, which was a, basically a pressure cleaner. But, uh, but I finally got my first real job. I'm 18, and, uh, and I decide, man, I, I'm getting, it's getting hard right here, so I went to Labor Ready. I don't know if you know what Labor Ready is. Yeah. Labor Ready is a place to go if you don't have a job, and you just show up, sign some papers, some waiver forms, and then basically construction workers come and pick you up uh, and take you to the job so that you can work for whatever construction company they have. So you just go, you sit, sit around and wait to be hired. And uh, I'm sitting there and uh, finally a guy comes in and says, all right, I need you to clear out this laundromat that just burned down last night and uh, you're going to have to just shovel all the debris out of there. And so me and about five other guys, four other guys, were called to the job. And luckily for me, I had a car. When you have a car, if you go, then they pay you an extra $2 per person that you bring. I was like, awesome. Eight more dollars right here. And as an 18-year-old, you're thinking, that's like three meals, you know? This is, that's a lot of money. So... So I get out there, I'm shoveling all day, sh shoveling this burnt down laundromat. And I find out that all the guys who had, had I had taken uh, had all just gotten out of jail. Whoa. And uh, they're all in jail for certain different crazy things. And I'm driving them in my car over there and I'm like, all right, okay, okay, all right. So, <laughs> so when did you get out of jail? <laughs> and, uh, and it's all just ex-cons in my car right here. And so then I'm at the job with the worker and I say, so, so what about the $2 I'm supposed to get? And, uh, and he says, oh yeah, you just need to ask all the guys in your car for the $2. Oh. They already know about it, so just tell them they need to give you $2. And I thought, there's no way I'm going to ask a bunch of ex-cons <laughs> who've been shoveling all day to give me two bucks. You know what I mean? And uh, so I just like, okay, whatever. And... Uh, End up getting back, getting my paycheck that night, and it was for $16 after taxes. And I thought, man, that was some labor in vain right there. Uh, a lot of vain things happened. Uh, a lot of things that I thought were going to turn out well didn't turn out well at all. And I'm walking away with $16. I had to go find another job, and I became a, a waiter at a restaurant. But, uh, but anyway, that's labor in vain. It stinks. It hurts. And it can happen to all of us at some point. And the Bible says, though, that your labor for the Lord, your labor in the Lord, is not in vain. Now, that's written because it's very easy for us to think, no, it is in vain. You know what I mean? Yeah. To think that, wow, I, I studied the Bible with this person for so long, and, and then at the end, they just disappear. That was all in vain. But the Bible says, no, it wasn't. Come on. For us going out there, tagging yesterday, we might think, man, that was really intense. Why did we go? But it wasn't in vain because we raised a lot of money. I mean, there were people giving us 20s all over the place. Even me and Sandra went up to a car and I was going with them, Sandra Villarino. And uh, we walk up and I just am begging them because it's snowing out. You know what I mean? So I was just like, Please help us. <laughs> and the guy 
like rolls down his window, takes a 20 out, puts it in. I'm like, come on, this is awesome. And I think the snow was my greatest ally in making that happen. Sabrina was out there cranking it. You know, we just, she was just like the lone ranger, like taking on like a whole row of cars. And, uh, and everybody else that I mentioned just did a phenomenal job. But for us, the labor was not in vain. It wasn't in vain. I think as disciples, even when we're raising this mission's contribution, you give it, and yet you don't see the results right away. All you know is, wow, we gave a lot of money. That's awesome. But we have to understand our labor, guys, is not in vain. And we need to think of all, I mean, there's been a lot of labor that's happened the past few months to raise our mission's contribution. Yeah. And We've all been unified. We've all been working hard. We've all been going after it. We've been sacrificing. And when we do it, Satan can try to make you think it's in vain. You've done this in vain. Maybe you've done it so many times, you think it's just another missions contribution right here. You know what I mean? Yeah. I know I've given, I've been around for you know, about 18 years. I've done this probably about 30 different times. And you can think, all right, here we go again. But to remember, it's not in vain. Why? Well, number one, the Bible says it's not. Amen? So you got the Bible telling you your labor is not in vain. But you also have the fact that this is going to help people. This is going to go plant a church in Queens. Uh, this is helping churches throughout the world. It's supporting uh, the central leadership who's given up so much so that they can be able to continue leading mercy in these different third world country churches. We're doing so much. It's kind of like when we planted San Francisco. We raised, it was our first time as a church ever breaking six figures for our missions contribution. We raised over $100,000. Guess what our goal was? $75,000. And we felt like we blew it when we hit 99. You remember that? We hit 99.9, I think. We were $100 short. And Roger Parlor gets up and writes a $100 check so that we could break six, uh, six figures. And uh, it was phenomenal. It happened right here in this room uh, three years ago. And it was the first time that that happened. And for us to blow out our contribution missions by 40% was unbelievable. But what that money did was sent out, not only paid for Chicago and helped us, but it also sent out the, the San Francisco mission team. Oh, yeah. And 19 people from here left to go plant San Francisco. And it was awesome. And even today, now the foundation's been laid. And so Brittany and I are back. But now that church has gone over 100. And they're the fastest growing church in the United States. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. And it wouldn't have been possible without the sacrifice from everybody here. Come on. Come on. I mean, even Elliot reaped some fruits of that because he just got married out in San Francisco. <laughs> Sheila Bell started dating out there, guys. I mean, we were helping not only people get saved, but helping miracles happen in Elliot's life, too. You know what I mean? So, guys, I think it's incredible, and we need to remember that your labor is not in vain. Why? The Bible says so. You may not be able to see it now, but God is working powerfully with what you give. Amen? And I just want to encourage you. I know we've already done the hard work. And now here's the day where we get to just give our contribution. But to understand that your labor is really being used in a great way. Amen? It's not in vain. Um, let's go to the next scripture, which is Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12, verse 11 says no discipline seems pleasant at the time but painful later on however it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it and if you don't have this underlined in your bible you're going to want to underline this as one of your main scriptures in life right here okay especially if you're a younger christian here this is your scripture right here memorize this there's a lot to see. Number one, we see what's so awesome about this scripture. It talks about a harvest of righteousness and peace. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. What is our harvest of righteousness and peace? Well, number one, it's seeing our souls saved. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. 
That's an awesome harvest. It's seeing righteousness come from, train, from, from the things it's talking about. But it's also seeing other people saved as well. And that's this harvest of righteousness and peace that we see that goes from what we're about to deal with right here, which is godly discipline. Amen? So it says the harvest of righteousness and peace come for those who have been trained. Amen? See, a lot of times we want the righteous, the harvest to come, but we haven't had the training yet. And so... What precedes the harvest of righteousness and peace is the training in your life. How fired up are you about training, about being trained, about learning what you don't know? Guess who the hardest people are to train? People who think they already know everything. You're, you can't train that person because they already have the right answer for everything. So we need to be a church if we want a harvest of righteousness and peace, a church that also is equally as fired up about training in the Lord. Amen, guys? So I, I hope this is really hitting you right now. And you're now thinking, who's my trainer? Who's going to be that person in my life that teaches me what I need to know? Who has God put in my life to train me to, to be a, a disciple the way God wants me to be? And you're thinking about that person. And then you say, all right. I'm just going to latch on to them whether they like it or not. Kind of like how a kid latches on to their, their dad's legs and they want to get dragged around. That's, that's what I'm going to be for, with this person. And they may try to kick me off, but I'm staying because I want to be close to this person. I want to get some training right now, right? So training happens and training precedes the harvest. Come on. But what does training come from? It comes from Discipline. But what does it say about discipline? No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful, right? So if you like being trained, then there's something else you need to like. Pain. Right? How, how, are, how are you in pain doing? How's your relationship? Do you like, do you like it? Or do you hate pain? You, you have to have an awesome relationship with pain and say, man, I, I love you, pain. I love you. Why? Well, because pain here is saying it's discipline from God. See, the world thinks that if there's pain, it's, it's obviously God doesn't care. But what we see here, let's look at the verse before it. Verse 10. Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. See, our parents disciplined us and it wasn't always perfect discipline. Why? Because our parents aren't perfect. And so yet when we get older, we should look back at our parents and say, mom, dad, thank you for your discipline because it taught me so much. I wouldn't be the person I am today if it weren't for the discipline of my mom and dad. And I can remember the late night spankings. I was a rebellious little kid. I would, I've done a lot of crazy things. Um, and there's been times where I've gotten spanked for a long time. And I'm very grateful that my parents disciplined me because it taught me to respect authority. And if I didn't have that, I'd probably be in jail or dead by now. You know, it doesn't seem pleasant, though. Imagine if when I got pulled into the room that my mom was about to spank me, I would say, Mom, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> mom, I understand that I've blown it. And I understand I deserve this spanking. And I want to let you know right now, I'm grateful for this spanking. <laughs> have you ever seen a kid do that? No. Why? Because it's painful at the time. Right? Like when we got disciplined, we didn't enjoy it. It wasn't something we wanted. But now we're grateful for it later on. You know, the difference though, is that this scripture calls you with God's discipline. First of all, God is the perfect father, right? 
So what does that mean? That means God is good, which means all his discipline is good for you. It's nothing to be sad about, which means the pain in your life is from God. God has put it in your life for your good, which means you should be fired up. And that's the difference with this scripture now versus when we were kids. That now when God disciplines us, when the pain comes in our life, we say, God, thank you so much. This is awesome. I'm so grateful for the pain because I know you're disciplining, you're training me. Can you have that heart through the hard times? It's a faithful heart. It's a heart that puts God above yourself. It's a heart that believes in God even when you don't understand. It's a heart that rejoices in suffering like the Bible talks about. And so for us, I want to challenge you to look at your pain differently. To look at the hardships, whether it's emotional or physical or your situation, and say, you know what? The Bible says that this is from God for my good. And then to say, I'm so fired up. Life couldn't be better right now because God is training me to have a harvest of righteousness. As adults, we're called to be fired up during the discipline. Amen? That's the difference between a kid and adult in the kingdom of God. That an adult is fired up as the discipline's happening. And a child, somebody who's immature, is freaking out. Amen? So can we all be adults in the room? Yeah. All right, that's awesome. Thank you. You know, yesterday I was impressed because as we were tagging, the blizzard came. And I mean, Billy Boucher, you should see pictures of him. His hair was pure white. It looked like he had a white helmet on. And all it was was snow that had stuck to his hair. And if you looked closely, there is ice on his eyelids and eyelashes. And you thought, man, this is radical. This is radical. And, but for everybody, I mean, I took a picture and everybody just looks so fired up. Because they understood, man, this is painful, but I love it. Because I know that God is doing awesome things through it. And you know, the people who go through hard times together are the closest as well. And those people who are tagging yesterday, I mean, there's a special bond we share. You know, it, I mean, I was going around asking people, hey, what is one word that describes how you feel? And people are like, I'm cold. <laughs> KC goes, Merry Christmas. <laughs> And then I come to King, and King wasn't wearing any gloves, and he just had a sweater on, and I asked him why, bro, and he, and, you know, he didn't really have a reason, and by this time, I think the cold had finally, like, started messing with his brain. And so I asked, you know, I'm asking, what's one word to describe how you're feeling right now, and King just goes, Jesus, Jesus. And I was like, hey, Brian, I'm fired up that at least you're saying what's getting you through the pain of right now. Amen. And, uh, but you know what it did is it bonded us. You know, like I feel a special attachment to everybody who was there yesterday. And, uh, and it, was, it was a memory that we can now have for the rest of our lives. And, you know, to have that is just something precious but also to know that we're out there doing whatever it takes. And now, when we post those script, those uh, pictures, literally, I have people responding from Europe, from uh, Florida, from New York City, from Los Angeles. I mean, people are like, wow, this is radical. This is sold out. This is what I remember, you know, when I was in Chicago, as people who would make it happen no matter what. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. And uh, it was just so inspiring. So for us, I think understanding discipline is from the Lord. And we have to understand that pain is not a bad thing. The world discredits God and religion because pain happening to people. And if God really existed, then why is there pain in the world? And they don't understand it's this scripture. 
I mean, we love our parents for the discipline they showed us. You know what I mean? They allowed us to have freedom, but they also disciplined us to train us. God is the same way. God allows us to have freedom, but he disciplines us to protect us for our own good. Amen. Amen? And so with our contribution, I mean, we've had the pain, but when we give, we know it's training by God, right? I mean, when you give your contribution, you're thinking, God, thank you. Because you are training me to love you more than money. Which is a rare thing in our culture today. But here we get to make a display, maybe not to the whole world because they're not watching, although they should. But we get to make a display to the heavenly realms. That for us, the world and its money does not matter more than our God does. And in your heart, you're being trained even by missions contribution to say, amen, God, thank you for this opportunity to train me so that I don't love money more than God. Amen. Because when you give it, you're saying, I love God first. It trains us because it allows us to be able to be disciplined and, and to really think through how are we going to make this happen, right? It's not like you came up with all this yesterday, unless you got really lucky and God had some mercy on you. You know what I mean? But, uh, but God is training us in our faith as well. And so one thing that happens is that when people sacrifice, when they do something like this, then what you see is that the final product is true according to the scriptures. The harvest comes. And in San Francisco, we tagged for six weeks straight, Wednesdays, Fridays, Saturdays, the whole church, because we had missed our missions. And you don't miss your missions. We're like, all right, we are going to make it happen right here. So for six weeks straight, every midweek, every Friday Devo, and then Saturdays on too, we just had everybody out there. We ended up raising $30,000 for about 40 people. And so by that time, afterwards, me and Brittany literally finished tagging, and then we left about a week later to go to New York City. But what happened was that the church just skyrocketed. Because the pain had trained them, and now a harvest of righteousness was coming. I want to encourage you right now, as a church, and individually too, that the pain is going to produce a harvest. The sacrifice produces a harvest. And it's not really sacrifice, right? I mean, could you go to somebody in India and say, man, look how much I'm sacrificing. When you have a car and a house, and maybe you go to school and a job, I mean, you can't go to these third world countries and say, man, we are giving up so much for God out here. They could say, well, let me show you what your life could look like. Let's get some perspective. So really, it's not sacrifice. Really, it's generosity that we're showing. Amen. We're being generous toward God. Galatians 6.1, it says, you reap what you sow. When you're generous, when you sow generously, you reap generously. So as we sow generously today, we can be sure that Galatians 6 is true. We will, as a church, reap generously from God. Amen? Doesn't that fire you up? It's a promise from the Lord. And what is that reaping? Well, it's a spiritual reaping, right? So I'm not promising you're going to get some check in the mail or your job is going to give you a bonus. Now, it might happen. It has happened before. But there are spiritual blessings that we get from this, especially seeing souls saved in the kingdom of God. Amen, guys? So I just want to say thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you to the taggers yesterday and making a memory of a lifetime. And thank you to everybody in the church for the sacrifice that you've done. It's been incredible. And I can't wait to just rejoice at the end of today. Amen, guys. Amen. Amen. Abjay, come on up and uh, preach right now. Okay. Good morning. I'd like Brittany to come on up and Barb. Now, some of you don't realize this. Uh, this is not our last Sunday. Yeah. Next Sunday will be our last Sunday, but it is uh, going to be a weekend where Mike and Brittany will not be here. Yeah. And uh, therefore, we won't be seeing them after this. Yeah. Okay. So uh, what I want to do is present to them a book. You guys, come up. Come on. Now, this is a special book. Yeah. All right, it, it says Chicago then and now, yeah. all right? And it's the same for us because it'll be different 
uh, by the time they end up going somewhere else. <laughs> yeah. Amen? Yeah. But what's special about this is it's a book that was given to Barb and I by Chris and Teresa Broom. Wow. So when we started the church here, uh, they wrote an inscription in here for us. It says, Jane Barb, it's hard to believe five years has passed so quickly in the blink of an eye. What a privilege it has been to serve alongside both of you. We know Chicago will continue to do amazing things under your care as you do, as you now uh, fight alongside the Underhills. Come on. Amen. This is not the end, but simply another chapter. We know we will see you again soon because we have your daughter. <laughs> Seriously, we love you to the, our hearts. To the end, Chris and Teresa. Wow. So now we've written to them. It says, Mike and Brittany, we are so very excited for you as we know that as we pass the torch on to you, that you will continue to do powerful things through the Lord. It's amazing to see all that God has done in the last three and a half years since you left. So as Chris wrote earlier in this book, this is not the end, but simply another chapter. So go in the strength you have and save Chicago. We love you dearly, Jay and Barb. Come on. Awesome. Thank you, Barb. Mm. Come on. Uh, where you at? Where you at? <laughs> Amen. You guys ready? I first, uh, first of all, I want to uh, thank all of you for your generosity. Uh, this is not a goodbye message. I'll be here next week. Okay. Uh, but I want to thank you for your generosity uh, to help out the Queen's uh, mission team. And it really does cost a lot of money. It is a very expensive place uh, to live. Uh, I also want to let you know that this is actually two plantings in one. Uh, we will be planting also a Latin ministry in the Queen's ministry. Uh, so uh, Victor and Marlene are going to be coming to uh, lead that planning. And uh, also we got a number of uh, Latinos coming with them. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so I want to thank the Lat Latin ministry there uh, for your sacrifice also. Uh, but the great thing is you will see uh, the impact that they will also have there. Uh, I want you to uh, remember today. Uh, this is our special contribution. At the end of this message, I'm going to say a prayer. We're going to take up the contribution. Uh, but I want you to remember today. And the reason being is, uh, years from now, when you hear the amazing things that Queen has done, uh, you'll remember that it was because of, of this uh, special contribution. But I also want to caution you. All right? Uh, money is a big deal. And uh, I want to talk to you about our hearts in contribution. Not just today, but for the remainder of your lives, to remember how Satan will work with money. And it's a pretty serious thing because I've seen many a disciple taken out by money. In Mark 4, verse 13, you don't have to turn there, it's the parable of the sower. And it talks about the, the third soil that gets choked out all right, by life's worries, all right, and the deceitfulness of wealth. And money is very deceitful. Uh, people uh, grow up believing in the American dream. And uh, the American dream has a lot of pain in it uh, that is ungodly. Uh, for me, growing up, I, didn't, I, I, I bought into the dream. All right? Uh, Mike talked about it. I was a, a paper boy. You know, on Sundays like uh, today, I'd be out there throwing out the papers, trying to make money. Money! And uh, my parents uh, did not give us an allowance. Our allowance was our meal on the table. That's just how it was. Uh, but as I grew, uh, I, 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 I saw that money uh, brought in a lot of stuff, as m many of you do. And I began to give my heart over to it. I remember as a teenager... Okay, I got a summer job uh, unloading uh, semis full of watermelons. Wow. Yeah, very exciting job for a teenager. And the way it worked was there'd be four of us to a trailer. Okay, and uh, they were all stacked up, and one guy had to go on top and pick up the watermelon and throw it to the other guy on the bottom who would put it in a crate. 
and then catch the next one. That's how it went. There's one on each side. Okay. Now, if you're on the top and you throw it wrong and it comes like this, you know, you, you wipe out the guy. And then you eat that watermelon. All right. And if you throw it wrong and too co close to the crate, they slam their hand on the crate. So you learn to perfect the throw, you know. And, uh, but the thing is, uh, you know, it's summer out, and the further you go down, the warmer and hotter it gets inside that trailer. And those watermelons start to rot. Yes. And so you'll be doing this thing, and then all of a sudden your hand will slide into one. That kind of thing. But I made the amazing amount of $5 per trailer. Yeah. Show me the money. And I was fired up. It was a lot of money back then. The gas was 32 cents a gallon. And so we would do like two trailers a day. $10 a day. It was awesome. And then I got a real job. What am I going to do with all this money? And you know how it is when you get your first real paying job. You just spend like crazy. But then something else happens. You know, for me, uh, I remember when I first became uh, a member of the church, uh, I got offered a job. This is back in 82. I got offered a job uh, thir starting pay, $32,000. And uh, what happens, and, and I was a goldsmith. I designed and made jewelry. That's what I did. And, and there was a lot of money that flew. And I started my own business, and I made a lot of money. And it was one of these things where a lot of these jewelers were, would go to jail. Almost every jeweler I worked for went to jail. Why? Because they couldn't handle the money. They started doing illegal things. And I'd have to testify in court. I had the FBI come to my house. All these things. But I didn't realize how it was starting to affect me. And how it began to start to own my heart. And, and you, you don't think it does, but it does. We're surrounded by greed. Look in Luke chapter 12. Come on, come on, Dave. Come on, Dave. Ate a lot of watermelon those days. Luke chapter 12, verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, Tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out! Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And I really began to, uh, you know... A change. I began to go ahead and, and, and put security in the abundance of my possessions. And for some reason, you just kind of keep gathering and keeping stuff. And Jesus said, do not store up treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy. I did not obey that. And I, I began to see how my heart was getting more and more given to, into it until... I was asked to, to, to come here and start the church here, help start it, did I realize how much it had attached to my heart. How painful it was to give things up. And that's just what happens. Then, of course, we, this situation right here, inheritance, was a reality to Barb and I as her parents passed away. And it is amazing to see what the family becomes once someone passes away and there's an inheritance. But that just shows how much greed becomes a part of our lives and becomes more and more scary. And Jesus says, watch out. Be on your guard. And what happens is you begin to worship another God. And it becomes who we are. You know, 
the the whole jewelry thing was painful because in in the mid what was it 2006 when all the banks did their things and people were losing money foreclosures you remember that yeah. Yeah. people don't buy jewelry when it's like that right. all right instead what they do is pay their rent pay their mortgage try to hang on to the house and so my business began to crumble and it was hard because uh, I, was, I, was, I wasn't getting any money. What do you do? Yeah. And these people are like, okay, pay the mortgage, buy jewelry. What are you going to do? You're not going to buy the jewelry. In fact, you're going to sell your jewelry. Yeah. And so everybody got into, I'm going to sell my jewelry. So I had all these people coming in, buy my ring, buy my gold. Well, if you don't have money to buy it, how does that work? And I thought, you know, what, what, is, what are other people doing? Well, I found out a lot of people going to Craigslist, right? Going Craigslist, sell your jewelry. And I thought, I'll do that. You know, of course, you know, your daughter now has to show you how to do this. Now, Dad, watch how to do this. You can do this, Dad. Next time, Dad, I showed you. I'm not going to help. No, just go ahead. We're trying to make money here. <laughs> but it does things to your heart. Look in Ezekiel chapter 28. Come on. Come on, and I, I want us to realize as a nation how our hearts can become corrupt. Amen. Ezekiel 28 verse 1. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, say to the ruler of Tyre, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. In the pride of your heart you say, I am a God. I sit on the throne of a God in the heart of the seas. But you are a man and not a God. Though you think you are as wise as a God, are you wiser than Daniel? There's no secret hidden from you. By your wisdom and understanding you have gained wealth for yourself and amassed gold and silver in your treasuries. By your great skill in trading, you have increased your wealth. And because of your wealth, your heart has grown proud. Therefore, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. Because you think you're wise, as wise as a god, I'm going to bring foreigners against you. The most ruth ruthless of nations, they will draw their swords against your beauty, and wisdom and pierce your shining splendor. They will bring you down to the pit and you will die a violent death in the heart of the seas. Will you then say I am a God in the presence of those who kill you? You know when I read this I thought you know this is like 9-11. We thought we're a powerful nation. Nobody can touch this. And it was a violent death for many. Yeah. And it pierced our souls, changed our history, changed how we, how we live. But this can happen to us individually. And I always want to caution myself from now, from what I've gone through. Greed promotes pride. Yeah. Yeah. And we forget what poverty really is all about. Remember years ago, uh, when Barb and I went to school in Malaysia, we, we were in Singapore also. And I'll never forget watching people there beg, okay? And there would be people, I remember this one person, who's lay, he was sitting there, he was, all, he was rigid, he couldn't move, had this growth on his neck, he's leaning sideways and he was drooling. And that's all he could do. And I said, I thought Singapore had no unemployment. And they said, that, that is employment. That's how they work. They beg. And it's such a far cry to where we're at now. We give our hearts over to it, and we, we whine and complain for what we don't have. I'm going to close in 1 Timothy and see how God feels about it. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Verse, verse 10. 
For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Verse 17, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of life that is truly life. This is a great passage. The love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And he says, once again, flee from that. And he lays out a strong challenge for Timothy. He says, I want you to command people, all right, not, not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, but to be generous. And in this way, they will lay up a treasure in heaven. The question is, are you living for the here and now? Or are you, are, are you here to give, to rescue people? It's challenging because it's all around us. It's everywhere you want to be. And for us, you know, once again, uh, as, in the, as a leadership, I, I want to say thank you so much for your generosity. Most of you have obeyed this and given your heart in it. But sometimes, if you like I was, you allow greed to fester in your heart. And not even know it. And the acid test is, what is your giving like today? Is it grumbling? Or is it gratitude? Is it passion and zeal? Or is it faithlessness? God looks down on us, and he has a spirit of one or two things. He's, well done, good and faithful servant. Or, be on your guard. Once again, I want to thank you guys. You're awesome. You're amazing. Uh, We've always blown out our special. I'm faithful that we will today. Uh, You guys uh, have done amazing things. Uh, Many people are going to honor God because of your sacrifice. Let's close in a prayer. God, thanks so much for you giving to us. I pray, God, that today we give with a heart of gratitude. That our hearts are not Uh, attached to wealth, but that we're grateful, that we see, God, that all you've done and how people have sacrificed for us for our freedom, and uh, God, that we will honor you. Once again, we worship you, God, and we're grateful for the cross. In Jesus' name, amen.